In the early hours of December 26, 1996, Patsy Ramsey found a two-and-a-half-page handwritten ransom note on the back stairs of their family home. It stated that their six-year-old girl, John Benet Ramsey, had been kidnapped for ransom. Several hours later, the little beauty queen was found dead in the family's basement. The ransom note in the John Benet Ramsey case has been a subject of intense scrutiny and debate. Was it written by a stranger or one of her parents? Handwriting analysis is not an exact science. Comparing the writing on the note with samples from family members and other suspects have resulted in contradicting views. The language used and the content of the note itself are quite inconsistent with your typical ransom notes from kidnappers. The length itself, two and a half pages, raises questions. Is the note authentic, or was it simply a means of distracting or confusing law enforcement from solving the case? Various theories and interpretations have been made regarding the Jean Bonnet ransom note, which has become a sticking point in this case. Today, we'll take a deeper look into the peculiarities of this letter to find out its authenticity and the writer's motive. The note, as previously stated, was two and a half pages long. It was handwritten and addressed to Mr. Ramsey. It said, Listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills, and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attaché to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an early pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices, and if any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions, and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny, as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It is up to you now, John. Victory. SBTC. Despite being warned by the kidnapper, the couple immediately called police. When Patsy called 911, she told the police that there was a note left by the kidnapper. But when asked about the content of the note, she replied, I don't know. When the police arrived at the Ramsey residence, John showed him the note which was lying on the wooden floor of the hallway, which led to the foot of the staircase. He told the officer that the note was found by Patsy on one of the steps. Their versions of this part of the story differed. According to Patsy, she took the letter to John upstairs. John, on the other hand, stated that he ran downstairs and the note was still down on the first floor. He stated that he spread it out on the floor. Later, the couple used John's version of the story. As for the kidnapper, he never called, and the body of John Benet was later found 
tied up, beaten and strangled with a black duct tape over her mouth, in the basement after a second search was made inside the home. The family and the police never found out who the murderer was. As one of the most important pieces of evidence that could point to the murderer's identity, the ransom note has been analysed by amateur and experts alike. The first fact that is known about the note is that it was written on paper owned by Patsy Ramsey, which was located on a little desk kind of area near the door to the kitchen. The pen used was also hers, which was found placed in its normal place, an orange metal container on the kitchen counter. In addition, there were no fingerprints on the ransom note at all. There is no record of the pen ever being tested. Of course, some of these details can easily be explained away. It's quite possible that the kidnapper wore gloves, so he didn't leave any fingerprints. In addition, there's no rule that states a kidnapper must use his own pen and paper when writing a ransom note. But we can't help but question why he wouldn't have prepared one if he had planned to kidnap John Bonet that night. According to experts, it would have taken the writer around 21 minutes to write the note. It's unlikely that an intruder would willingly spend that much time inside the house. After all, it would have been easy to get caught. Or did that mean he was unafraid of being caught? According to the police, there were missing pages from the notepad that indicated the kidnapper had written at least one practice draft based on some missing pages and ink bleed through on the pad. The missing pages, by the way, were never found. More importantly, how could John and Patsy's fingerprints be missing from the ransom note? Who would have the foresight to prevent the paper from being contaminated without knowing that it was a ransom note? They clearly stated that both of them had picked up the note, so why were their fingerprints missing? It's a question that has never been asked nor answered. Handwriting Analysis There has been a lot of debate regarding the handwriting in the ransom note. Some experts believe that the note is not an ideal specimen for handwriting analysis, despite its length. This is because the type of pen used, a broad fiber tip pen, masks and distorts fine details in a person's handwriting. Could the handwriting have been disguised? Some experts don't think so. They state that it's actually difficult to disguise one's handwriting the longer a document is. In addition, they claim that there's no evidence that the writer disguised his or her handwriting. Handwriting analyst Gideon Epstein disagrees. He believes that there was actually an attempt to disguise the true handwriting habits of the writer. Ted Widmer, director and principal instructor of the International School of Handwriting Sciences in San Francisco and author of Crime and Penmanship, has stated, this ransom note was written by a person who was trying to disguise their handwriting. Karen Ionette, a handwriting consultant of various agencies, also believes that the handwriting is disguised, pointing to the slow, tense, hesitant pressure pattern and patching made in letter structures beginning on the first page of the note. If the handwriting is disguised, then is it even possible to find out who the author is using handwriting analysis? It's hard to say. Here's what we do know. Handwriting analysis has ruled John Ramsey out, but it couldn't eliminate Patsy from the list of possible writers. There are some consistencies in the individual letter formations and letter combinations between her handwriting to that of the author's, but it isn't enough to positively identify her as the author. Some experts, such as Gideon Epstein, are certain that she was the one who wrote the note. Others, including several certified forensic document examiners, are not as certain, though they believe that it is highly probable. The language of the note. There have been many interpretations regarding the words used in the note. For example, the misspelled words in the ransom note such as business and possession was considered unusual by forensic linguistic expert James Fitzgerald. According to him, the misspelling might have been done on purpose to disguise the writer's level of education. Fitzgerald also reports that the font-style printing is a feminine trait. Patsy Ramsey used this letter form in her handwriting. 
He believes that it is unusual for both handwritings to come from the same household and to be so close. The tone of the ransom note was also analyzed. According to forensic document examiner Brenda Anderson, this fake ransom note has less emotion than a typical anonymous threat. A person who wants to threaten or intimidate someone will emphasize certain words in the letter. However, the writer did not do that, which led some experts to believe that there was no real threat. If it were John Bonet's parents who wrote the letter, they would have no reason to put that much emotion in the note. Aside from the tone, many have commented that the language in the ransom note bears strong similarities to certain movies. Let's take Dirty Harry, for example. There are similar phrases in the movie that can be read in the ransom note. Now listen to me carefully. If I even think you're being followed, the girl dies. If you talk to anyone, I don't care if it's a Pekingese pissing against a lamppost, the girl dies. That's the end of the game. The girl dies. It sounds like you had a good rest. You'll need it. Aside from the similar lines, there are also some similarities in the storylines, such as the specified denomination of bills and the type of container for delivery of the ransom. In the movie, the kidnapper uses counter-surveillance, and then there's the fact that the girl was already dead while Harry was running all over town. That being said, there are no verbatim quotes. Not a single phrase in the letters could be directly attributed to Dirty Harry or any other movie. It could simply be coincidental or an overinterpretation of some. Or the writer has watched a lot of crime movies or even crime fiction and took inspiration from some of them. All in all, we cannot definitively state that these similarities are relevant to identifying the author of the note. What about the ransom amount? Like many details about the note, the amount of the ransom was also questioned by many. Why $118,000? According to science, humans have an irrational preference for round numbers. So why not 120,000 or 100,000? Why that specific number? According to John Ramsey, he received a bonus of $118,117.50 from the previous year. It was paid in February 1996 and would show in his monthly payment stub for the rest of the year. Some believe that this indicates inside information. Only someone close to the family or a person connected to Access Graphics could have knowledge of this. However, proponents of the intruder theory argue that the kidnapper could have seen a paycheck stub while he was at the house. He was, after all, inside for several hours. The kidnapper could also have seen Ramsey's handwritten ledger, which showed that he had a total liabilities amounting to $1,118,000. Of course, if the kidnapper actually looked at the rest of the ledger, he would have seen that the Ramseys had a total net worth of $6,230,628. So, why would he request an unusually small amount? Some propose that the number could have a biblical reference while others think it might have a movie reference. For example, The Silence of the Lambs has a runtime of 118 minutes. In the movie Nick of Time, 1.18 p.m. is the exact time at which the father could have saved his six-year-old daughter if only he had killed the governor. Another theory about the ransom amount is that it was equal to exactly 1 million Mexican pesos using the prevailing conversion rate at the time. Could it be that the intruder was from Mexico or of Mexican descent? Or did he plan to go to Mexico after he got the money? Speaking of foreigners, the writer mentioned that he was part of a group of foreign terrorists. Some of the details in the letter support this claim, such as being familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. The word victory and the use of an abbreviation for their organization, SBTC. The kidnapper never elaborated on what SBTC stood for. There are many interpretations provided by theorists on this, such as shall be the conqueror, which is a phrase connected with one of the suspects, John Mark Carr, signed by the captain, which is a common phrase in sailboat racing where a win is referred to as a victory. Square, Bible, and the compass 
which are three Masonic symbols seen on their crest or seal. Stand before the cross, which is part of a scene in the Dirty Harry movie. Strangled by the cord, referring to how John Bonet died. While it's possible that the kidnapper was a foreign terrorist, there's also a hint of familiarity and enmity towards John Ramsey. He calls John a fat cat and warns him against trying to grow a brain. Though he starts the letter by calling John Mr. Ramsey, he mentions him by his first name a couple of times towards the end of the note. This supports the theory that the writer is someone close to the Ramseys. Someone who might have easy access to their home and have knowledge about John's bonus. The kidnapping could really have been an inside job. However, some argue that the phrase good southern common sense indicates that the writer was a stranger. John Ramsey was originally from Michigan. Patsy was from West Virginia. Someone who knew the family well would not have made this kind of mistake. Not unless he wanted to throw off the investigators. Experts have worked up different profiles on the ransom note writer. According to retired FBI agent Clint Van Sant, the writer is a well-educated female between the ages of 29 and 40. She knew the family, as well as the home, very well. The words, be well rested and other caring or nurturing language used in the note, convinced them that the writer was female. The FBI further deduced that John Bonet was already dead when the note was written. A forensic psychologist, Stephen A. Diamond, analyzed the note in 2017 and came to the conclusion that the writer is an intruder for whom English is a second language. A member of a foreign faction, perhaps. Some theorize that the author could be the father, John, or her half-brother, John Andrew. But based on the evidence that we have discussed, it is highly unlikely that it was one of them. Two handwriting experts, Mazel Martin and Dawn McCarty, recently told the U.S. Sun that there were significant similarities between the handwriting on the note and Gary Oliver's handwriting. Gary Oliver is one of the suspects in the case, though he has already been cleared by the Boulder Police Department. A local reporter named Chris Wolfe was also suspected of writing the ransom note. According to his live-in partner who turned him in, Jacqueline Dilson, his handwriting resembled the one in the note. Forensic document examiner Lloyd Cunningham also testified that he cannot eliminate Wolf as the author of the note. Moreover, there was a single editing mark on the note that experts claim point to the author having a degree in journalism. Wolf has a master's degree in journalism. That being said, Patsy also has a bachelor's degree in journalism. And based on everything we've looked at, she just might be the best suspect in this case. At least, as the writer of the ransom note. As for why a ransom note was written, there are several theories that cover that as well. If it was truly Patsy who wrote the letter, it might have been used as a diversion to mislead the police during the investigation and point to an outsider committing the crime. If it was a stranger, the ransom note could have been part of a real kidnapping plot that went wrong. It could also have been a way for the murderer to confuse the police as to why John Bonet was missing. Or it could be that the author wanted to get John out of the house for nefarious purposes. We may never know. With so much conflicting interpretations and a lack of definitive evidence, we cannot safely conclude the true motivation of the writer, nor identify him or her. We can only hope that the answers will be found one day and the enduring tragic mystery of John Bonet's death will finally be solved. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.